my name is Blaine Como. I'm on the board of directors for the International Association of Directional Drilling. And on behalf of uh, Jim Oberkirker and the rest of the board, I want to thank all of you for attending today. Uh, we've got a very um, exceptional lineup of speakers today, some industry legends, I would even say. And uh, uh, we're just going to go ahead and get started. I'm first up, so we'll start with this. The theme of the, the day is basically uh, well bore quality is good enough, good enough. Uh, I, we've been, some of us have been talking about well bore quality for a very long time, and we're going to go over some of those essential things about well bore quality in this first presentation. And hopefully I hope you'll see the, uh, this question is much more relevant today than it's ever been before. So a little bit about myself, I'm a senior con uh, technology consultant for Kittitzup Consulting. Um, prior to that, my whole career was with Sperry Drilling, where I held a number of roles, including the uh, global product champion for the Geopilot rotor steerable system, and also a product that I'm going to refer to much a lot today called Slick Bore, which was a, uh, a motor-based uh, borehole um, level quality system, basically. Um, I was also a marketing manager, so I do know how to spin things, but I'm going to lay all that aside today, hopefully, and just give you the straight up. And, uh, and again, I'm independent. I'm not with anyone. If I say we, I'm referring to Sperry because I just can't help it. Okay, I was with them for so long. I am, I am them. But uh, again, I hope you find this is just as objective as possible. Also co-authored a paper on this topic. And um, we'll, we'll get into that as well. And worked on the torque and drag software. So, which is a very essential part of understanding well bore quality. Okay, so the question that we have today is this. At $40 a barrel, can you afford to dismiss any possible cost reduction idea? All right, we have got to find ways of doing it even cheaper than we're doing it now. And at the same time, we've gotten so good at it that it's harder to get faster, but there are still things we can do to get even faster than we're drilling now. And also to do it with greater consistency well after well after well. That's an, another thing that we could work on is the variability within our, our drilling uh, uh, processes from one well to the next. So <clears throat> what do we mean when we say well bore quality? Well, there are any number of ways of measuring this and you can use any of them that you like. Uh, I don't have a particular one, although we're gonna be talking a lot about the uh, tortuosity index that's been developed by the UT uh, University of Texas at Austin. But really, when we say we want a, a high quality well bore, what we really mean is just this. It's very, very simple. We want it to be as straight as possible, given the directional objectives, of course. We want it to be smooth, free from rugosity or micro tortuosity, free from spiraling, which I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about today. We want it to be full drift diameter. Now, if you drill an eight and a half inch hole, do you think you could run eight and a half inch casing in that hole? No. Know that that's not ever going to work right but could we uh, do some things to make sure that that drift diameter is not compromising our efficiency and that is really the root of this is that we are compromising efficiency we have parasitic energy that's being lost parasitic torque and drag so and of course we also have a competing need to keep it in the target zone and that drives some of our tortuosity if you will but so the, we have to meet both of these objectives. We have to make sure we maximize contact with the best rock while minimizing torque and drag. So this is a shot down a well bore. Actually, this isn't a well bore. This is a cement block. And it was drilled with a very long gauge drill bit. And we're going to talk a lot about extended gauge and long gauge bits. We, uh, we, it'd be lovely if our well bores actually looked like that, but that ain't, that ain't reality. This is more like it, right? Especially if you're using uh, high bend settings on mud motors without stabilization, you're gonna spiral the well bore. It's guaranteed. And if you're using higher than two degree bend setting with no stabilization, you have drilled a spiral well bore, okay? So that's the issue that we need to tackle. And I'm going to show you a lot of stuff from my history with Sperry, but I don't want you to take my word for it. There are any number of technical papers that you can go and look at that will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that 
all of these things are compromised. Everything is compromised in drilling well if you're, if you're drilling a crooked well. The rate of penetration, we saw, we'll see this from Apache, and I think Alan Valley with us today. He's co-authored on that paper. So Alan, thanks for the input on this. Uh, but Apache worked together with UT Austin and they, they demonstrated that rate of penetration is compromised. Shell, Teresa Baumgartner, recently showed that NPT goes up and your risk of loss and hole is, is dramatically higher if you are um, uh, not uh, in, in the more tortuous wells versus the straighter wells. Well placement, Bill Lesso's with us today. Uh, he and Ed Stockhausen did this quite some time back, but there's continuing work on this where using uh, continuous surveys, they were able to show how the, the well was not where they thought it was, and that affected uh, the placement and even resulted in, in compromising of production, which, you know, God forbid that we ever would compromise the production, but they, they show that whole cleaning and your ability to model that accurately, work over costs. Uh, lease operating expense over the life of the well, the total, ownership, total cost of ownership for the well is, is going to be compromised. And we have Adrian Ledros, uh, co-author on that paper with us today to speak on this. And unfortunately, by the time gyro data gets called into the fact, it's, it's in a forensics mode. It's the failure has happened. The ESP has failed. The sucker rods have worn out prematurely. And then they discover, oh my gosh, look at what this well bore looks like. And then Stefan Manon and, and Katie Mills at, uh, and the rest of their co-authors at DrillScan have shown us uh, through this paper that your ability to accurately model torque and drag is severely, severely compromised if you're not taking into effect the tortuosity in the wellbore. And they did a lot of work. And we're going to hear a lot about different aspects of tortuosity. We're going to hear a lot about continuous uh, inclination, continuous surveying today. So again, and we're going to hear these things repeated throughout the day for tool face control. But I really want to focus on that poor tool face control. So the root cause of that poor tool face control is because you have a, 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 a long slender element that is making contact with different points in the well bore because that well bore isn't straight. And when the, that contact, those contact points are constantly changing, you have a very dynamic weight transfer that's happening. And that dynamic on off weight transfer is then causing the bit to engage and disengage. And you do not have a nice, smooth, consistent weight transfer. And that's going to cause the tool face to fluctuate. That's the root cause behind erratic tool face. And that's, you know, that can really hamper um, our ability to steer the well. Uh, poor weight transfer also will reduce the rate of penetration. You have cuttings build up because you've got troughs on the low side of the hole from the spiral events. And those are going to be very hard to agitate uh, when your agitation elements in the BHA are standing off because they're being supported by the, the peaks on the rest of the spiral hole. High vibration, uh, uh, and you're gonna see that as a result of, uh, um, you know, you, you suffer all these things. These are symptoms, right? <clears throat> How do we measure that though? How do we know that it's happening? Well, unfortunately, most of the time it's, it's not, it is not easy to measure, first of all. Uh, we could go to shorter survey distances, so our 90 foot would become more like 30 feet and we might be able to see more of this tortuosity, but no one's gonna stop to do that. That's a non-starter, right? You could put multiple survey tools up and down the stream and do simultaneous surveys at multiple points, but that's extra cost, that's extra expense. No one's going to do that. Bending moments are uh, in an MWD or LWD tool. If you have a bending moment sensor, that can give you a very good understanding of what's happening on a foot by foot basis, but those are rarely available. They're not, and they are more expensive. So now continuous surveying, Tim is going to talk, Tim Patton at Superior QC is going to talk a lot about continuous surveying and I'll just leave that for him to cover. But those will reveal local undulations in the well bore and real time torque and drag, which is what I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about, which is one of the, the best ways of monitoring what's going on. However, we really don't want to be better at measuring how bad the hole is. We want to drill the hole better in the first place. So we wrote this paper when I was with Sperry almost 20 years ago, tortuosity versus micro tortuosity, why little things mean a lot. And the basis of this um, presentation 
our, our paper was based on work that we had been doing in the North Sea. Uh, we had established a database of over 100 wells where we were collecting, uh, uh, pick up the slack off readings from the rig in real time and building a database of, if you plug the, the real time values back in torque and drag, you can do the reverse calculation and it will tell you what the friction factor is that's at work to generate those sorts of readings. And we were just doing that methodically, consistently. We had a great database built up and we knew what kind of friction factors to expect in, in water-based, oil-based, synthetic mud back then. Um, and then we introduced this system that we call, which consisted of an extended gauge bit. And when I say extended, I mean, it's longer than just long. The rule of these bits was that there was a, one, a ratio of 1.5 to one as far as the gauge diameter, uh, the gauge length to the bit diameter. All right, so an eight and a half inch bit would have 12 inches of gauge roughly. And we routinely drilled these with a very, very tight process. We never varied from that rule. That was a policy from on high. You will not deviate from this because we were stepping out. We were experimenting with this thing. No one had tried to drill directional wells with the drill bits like and that's an important point because all of the basis of what we were seeing with these standard assemblies was exactly the same kind of results that we were seeing all over the rest of the world. We weren't doing anything uh, different with our conventional assemblies. So when we introduced this to the, to the mix, we started seeing these friction factors that were basically equivalent to a case hole. Uh, we had never seen that before. And the point I'm trying to make is if this was the only time that we had ever seen those kinds of friction factors with a steerable system, and this, and this is the only place that this kind of system was being run, and we were eliminating borehole spiraling in, to, in order to get these kinds of friction factors, then by conclusion, everywhere else that people were drilling with conventional assemblies must be spiraling the borehole. That's the conclusion, all right? <clears throat> it is ubiquitous. Uh, we, we had, I also want to point out that this also had a, a mud motor with a very short bit to bend distance and there was no stabilization on the motor, but we always had a stabilizer at the top of the motor. So we had three points of geometry, the face of the bit, the back corner of the bit and the top of the motor. So the bit was actually in that three point geometry. It was the first and second, oops, sorry, first and second points. Now we've done some of the things more recently uh, since this uh, time, but on this project, uh, we, we reduced the overall drilling time. We actually uh, greatly increased the amount of time we were actually drilling because we got rid of all of this excess circulating time. This excess circulating time was causing us all sorts of problems because you pick up off bottom and back ring to try to clean the hole and you're gonna destroy your MWD, okay? We all know this. So if you can drill the hole straight in the first place and maximize the cleaning efficiency of that hole, you will greatly reduce the amount of time you have to take trying to clean up the mess. So drill it straight in the first place is kind of the message. Now let's fast forward to the last few years. I'm gonna make reference to multiple uh, papers here that will address the different ways that we have proven that well more quality does matter and that good enough is not good enough. This is from the uh, Apache together with the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and this is just from a couple of years ago. They looked at about three years worth of work in the Permian. So this is bringing it home, our backyard. Over 300 lateral sections, they analyzed these sections using the tor uh, tortuosity index of uh, created by the University of Texas as part of the Rapid Consortium, which Apache is a part of that. Um, and they broke up the wells into these five tiers of tortuosity from the very best to the very worst. And then they analyzed those sets of wells and saw that the average rate of penetration in the very best wells uh, were, was significantly higher than the rest of the wells in terms of tortuosity. Now, interestingly enough, uh, this section right here was made up of a whole lot of slick assemblies, right? And what have we been running a, a lot of and hearing about slick assemblies, slick, slick assemblies that are guaranteed to produce the worst well bore. Ah, oh, now I want to look at, oh, yeah. 
So this is just to make this very, very visual. And I want to thank um, uh, Superior All Tools with the, uh, the their drill and ring tool because I, I grabbed some images from, from their video for this. And I would like, I'd like you to take a look at that video because it really does answer uh, a lot of questions. But you've got a stabilizer and hole, you've got a torture swell path, up and down, spiral, uh, whatever you like. And you're going to increase the amount of contact and it's gonna vary as you make your way through this progressive spiral. And so this erratic contact of the different points along the assembly, and this goes also for transitions of diameter from the BHA to the heavy weight and for every tool joint, all of those points of contact are gonna be much more in contact with a spiral hole because you do not have full drift diameter. When you look down the gun barrel, you see the dotted line showing how the, the true diameter of that well bore significantly less. And we've seen it as much as an inch and a half less than an eight, you know, eight and a half inch hole really has a true diameter, drift diameter of seven, seven and a quarter inches. So what did we do? Well, we took out the stabilizer. That was the wrong answer, okay? You still have the spiral. You didn't fix the problem. You merely got rid of the thing that was causing you the headache, but that didn't necessarily improve things. In fact, you, you rotate it without any kind of constriction with stabilization points, bigger spiral, right? And what did we do? 2.12 housing settings on slick assemblies. My gosh, you know. So coming back to this. Ooh. Hope everyone's receiving this okay. Um, so let's just dial in on the very best and the second group. All right, so that second group is what I'm gonna call our good enough group. And I'm gonna eliminate even the, first, the third, fourth, and fifth because, well, none of us are drilling wells like that, right? All right, but let's just look at the best possible average rate of penetration Average on a large scale, this is a statistical study, and compared to the second group. If we look at the difference between a maximum potential rate of penetration of 142 in the very best and the 616 max in the second best, that's almost an 18% loss of potential rate of penetration. And rate of penetration is our number one KPI. So there it is, I could stop right now go home. This is the smoking gun. If you are prepared to leave 18% average rate of penetration on every well you drill and then carry on. But this I think is the smoking gun that says well bore quality is worth paying attention to and it will benefit you in the number one KPI. But don't just stop with rate of penetration and I'll say no, good enough is not good enough. But Shell did this massive study, over 800 wells that had some level of NPT in them. They looked at all those wells, they ran them through this same tortuosity index that, that UT developed. Shell tweaked that a little bit, but it's the same basic premise. And they grouped these wells into five different categories of tortuosity, just like Apache did. Now on the left are, is the vertical section tortuosity. So they isolated the vertical, the build and the lateral and they, uh, they ran the tortuosity on just the vertical section. And what they found was the very best wells had 21% less NPT than the next best category. Not even looking at the worst ones, but going from good enough to best resulted in a 21% drop in potential NPT time and that's averaged over 174 wells. So again, statistically valid. Now I will give you on the second set, the lateral tortuosity, you see the first two groups, there isn't a lot of difference in the amount of NPT in group one and group two. However, overall, the worst wells had twice as much NPT on them on average than the very best wells. So again, think these papers, like I said, um, don't take my word for it. Look at what the industry has shown. Here, good well bore quality. How do we engineer it? Make sure that it's there on a consistent basis every single time. 
it starts with the drill bit. You have got to pay attention to the drill bit design and you have got to increase the gauge length on the drill bits. Seen some folks doing this lately. Uh, Apache has been doing this. They're using a one-to-one. -one. Oxy's doing it with a one-to-one -one ratio. Oxy is drilling 10 degree per 100 curves with 10 inches of gauge length, all right? Now, you must also take in, into account the motor design. You want to go with the shorter pos uh, shortest possible bit to bin um, distance on these motors. You also want to use lower bin settings and that's going to help to reduce the amplitude of the spiral. And, um, but you, uh, oh, and stabilizer des design, you also have to make sure that you're not going with excessively long stabilization. You need to look at what is the crown length on that stabilizer and compare it to the length of gauge on the drill bit. And this is another oxy policy. They will not run a stabilizer that has a crown longer than the gauge length on the drill bit. So they're making sure that everything's gonna pass through whatever shape that hole is, the stabilizers are all chosen to make sure that they will pass through and get rid of that. And also chamfer all the edges and, and make it a, the lowest possible uh, uh, friction surface. But the BHA design is where all this comes together and you've got to do good BHA design. And I want to uh, acknowledge drill scan. Uh, they did, a, uh, they were used, Apache used uh, their system for modeling all of this and credits uh, that model with, um, you know, being able to achieve a high level of accuracy. And, um, and then the hole straightening technologies, whatever happens with the drill bit, these hole straightening technologies, and we're gonna hear from, from both of these guys today, these are going to be the, the, the insurance policy that guarantees that any sort of undulations are straightened out and that you have a consistent borehole quality well after well after well. But you must do this while drilling. That rock has to be drilled in a straight path. You don't want the drill bit wandering around the center line of the, of the borehole. And the only way to do that is to restrict it at the bit. And we have seen these bits pulled green time after time after time because that extended gauge helps to keep the bit on center and it minimizes any kind of chatter or vibration. And I've heard this also from the guys with Altera. They're saying, yeah, man, we're pulling these, we're running these longer gauge bits and they're pulling them green. One of the problems when we were doing this with the, the rotor steer bolt, the Geopilot, and with slick bore was that our brethren over at Security DBS were having to manufacture two bits every single time. And we rarely ever had to pick up the second bit. And this is hundreds and hundreds of runs, guys. We were pulling bits green, one, one, or one, two. We drilled with one bit in, the, in, in Tuscaloosa, in Louisiana from BP and drilled for over 600 hours on one run, all right? So that is incredible durability and you don't get that kind of life out of a drill bit unless you are constraining it with the gauge uh, protection. So also important, tapered. The gauge must be tapered. You do not want the drill bit becoming a, a restraint when you're trying to do the high curvatures that we're doing with these 10 degree curves. If you're gonna use these drill bits in, in the curve, uh, you must make sure that you have clearance and that that bit does not make contact. What we did with slip for was we engineered it so it did make contact, but that's bad. But others have come behind us and found that, you know, the, the long gate can be implemented and it can be designed. And uh, that's kind of where I'm, I'm gonna leave our, our talk. Here's an example of three bits on the far left is our conventional old timey bits. We're not running too many of these anymore, I don't think. But that's about a half to one ratio, maybe four inches on an eight and a half inch bit, something like that, right? The far right is what we were doing with Slick 4 and with the Geopilot. And, um, and like I said, we controlled this very, very tightly. Uh, we did vary from this. And the newer renditions of Geopilot have moved away from the extreme length of this. But uh, we have ample uh, evidence. The reason this talk is called is good enough, good enough. I'll delay a little bit here, but many years ago, I was in the Tim Travis office. And if y'all know Tim Travis, he was the subject matter expert on rotor steerables for Exxon Mobil. And I was in his office and I was trying to pitch the Geopilot and all the wonderful level of quality. And I'll make an important point. Rotary steerables improve weld quality. That's a given. So 
Okay. It's just a question of which one is best. Well, so Tim says, Blaine, I give it to you. The Geopilot is the best weldable quality of any of the rotary steroids. But the others get me about 80% of the way there. And that's good enough. Well, I, I'll grant you other rotor steerables do improve well more quality, but rotor steerables are only one part of our solution and we're still relying very heavily on mud motors and there's more to be gotten out of mud motors by uh, embracing some of these ideas, folks. So that's what we're do doing right now. Oxy's using a one-to-one -one ratio. I think Apache, I think others are, are coming to this and, and making it work, figuring out how to work. They're also putting the stabilizers back in now that they understand the compromise that that represents. Look at these different stabilizers. Which one do you want to try running through a tortuous hole? Not a good idea to pick that first one. These others, the um, I believe they are called the auto track, the D track, and the NOR track. Today, you need to be investigating this and paying attention to that part of it. So, in conclusion, what's the value of level quality? I think we've seen that rate of penetration can be improved as much as 20%. MPT can be reduced dramatically. Uh, hole cleaning is, is going to be improved and you'll spend less time doing that and way more time with the bit on bottom making progress. And in production, we're going to hear from Bill Lesso uh, a little bit later today on that, but Chevron has proven that um, with their work as well. So with that, I'm going to uh, uh, try to stop talking for a little bit now. Um, but <clears throat> so the questions for the panel uh, session that's going to be coming up uh, later this hour. And so we're going to go right into our next speaker, uh, which is uh, Chris Eli with a, uh, a rival oil tools. He's a 24 year uh, oil field veteran. He started with neighbors in 1996. Uh, he's done a number of different roles, including uh, fluids engineer with Bayroy, directional drilling for Sperry. Uh, and he was the, uh, Technical, uh, Global Technical Advisor and Remote Operations Manager for Phoenix. And uh, he co-founded WellSite Software uh, in 2016. And he is uh, currently uh, uh, with uh, Arrival All Tools as a Global Operations Manager. So Chris, why don't you come on up? Thank you, sir. Use the mouse. mouse. Okay. Pointers also plugged in too. Thanks, guys, for having me. Uh, thanks for showing up. I know that there's not many people here, but hopefully online there's quite a few people. But thanks for braving it and being here. Um, I am Chris Eli. Thanks for the introduction, Blaine. Um, I've been in the oil and gas uh, services industry since 1996. I have a degree in finance, but rarely use it. <laughs> I'm more probably a, a technical uh, engineer by trade. So um, we're gonna talk about wellbore spiraling and what we've discovered over at Arrival. Um, it may, it, may, it, it kind of goes along with what Blaine was saying. Um, we have some interesting information. Uh, we, we uh, last year, we uh, analyzed about 13 and a half million feet of uh, well bore drilling. So um, it's quite a bit of information. I'm not gonna bore you with all of it today because it's very technical and there's a lot of it, but I have some of it here to share with you. So who, give you a little bit of background on who we are. So. Uh, Arrival Oil Tools, uh, my boss, Larry Como, uh, we have about 40 patents on downhole drilling tools, anywhere from electrical, um, MWD components, uh, hydraulics, um, and mud motors. Uh, my boss actually uh, designed one of the first multi-load stage mud motors in the industry. So we build, we, we currently build these, these equipment and uh, we manufacture and design and we've done that over four years. So we've got a lot of experience and we have uh, world-class facilities that we do this in. Our roots, uh, Sperry Drilling Services, Halliburton, Schlumberger, uh, Precision, Departure, Latitude and Ensign. 
So we, we have uh, roots in oil and gas, oil field services. Uh, at one time, my boss was um, number three at Halliburton for many years, and then um, he, he's, his name is still on the patents of half of their tools or some of their tools. Uh, World-class engineering, we do have testing and support and services facilities here in North America. Leduc, uh, Alberta, Canada is our, is our headquarters. That's where we have our facility there. We have a, in, we have a top drive in, installed uh, full flow loop. Uh, we're testing our tsunami, which is an axial vibration tool um, right now up there. And we also manufacture rotary steerable components as well. So, you know, like Blaine said, uh, it, the industry has pretty much accepted that wellbore spiraling is the norm. Uh, what, what I think that we haven't learned is that from talking to audit engineers face to face is that there's a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of uh, confusion on rotary steerables causing spiraling. So if, if I have a conversation with somebody, usually they say, well, we're running rotary steerable. We don't have a spiral well bore. Yes, you do. Uh, so these studies have proven that from the bit to the first point of contact, whether it's the rotary, whether it's a, a, a stabilizer on a motor, whether it's a bin housing on a motor, a wear pad, any of those, those points co correlate between those distances of those peaks and valleys. It's proven. So we, now the amplitude of these is up for discussion. The amplitude of the spiraling and the peaks and valleys, we can discuss that. That changes with BHA design. But this pattern leads to many technological issues. And one of them is what Blaine talked about, which is effective cross-section reduction. So the regularity of the pitch, usually ranging between two to 10 feet, is related to the distance between the bit and the first piece of equipment that touches the well bore. You can measure it in a, in a borehole image log and you will come up with the exact same distance of the peaks and valleys between the bit and the next contact point of the BHA, whether that's the, RSS pads, motor stabilizer, what have you. So what are some of the technological issues? Uh, we, we see lower than expected rate of penetration. We see increased wear of stabilizers and drill pipe. We see increased torque and drag. Issues running and setting casing. Poor hole cleaning. Suboptimal cementing conditions, reduced reduction in bit life, like one mentioned, decreased reliability of drilling tools, lower than performance on push the bit RSS tools. And in a recent poll, we asked drilling engineers and drilling managers, over 87% agreed that micro tortuosity increases the risk of NPT. So people believe that. They, there's a problem. Tortuosity causes a problem for them. So redu reduced cross-section. So when drilling both with conventional and RSS assemblies, the well bore will experience some level of spiraling. And if you can see um, right, you know, right in this area, you know, you have a re reduced cross-section of seven and a half inches. So like it, it's it's like uh, taking a water hose and sticking a steel rod through it. it it's not if the if the hose is one inch ID and the rod is one inch ID, it's not going to go through. It's because the hose is not truly that. So the drift changes. Spiraling causes this reduction in this drift, and we see this in in we see this in different amplitudes across. Um, across different basins, different rock compaction rates, different density of rock changes the spiraling pattern, so, but it always is there. So you can see 
as this passes through, you have a 40 inch pitch. This is a four, this is modeled on 40 inches. So I don't know how to, there it is. So from the peaks and the valleys, you have 40 inches and a half inch offset. This is typically what we see in most jaw, in most uh, wells that we in, anticipate is the 40 inches could be bit to bend on a beat on a on a motor. It could be uh, it could be bit to RSS pads, whatever that distance is. If we model it, we can tell you what the what the effective cross section reduction. So what is the bit, Here, here's one of the issues in the industry. What is your bit to contact distance? Is it 36 inches? Is it 48? Uh, does anybody know uh, when they're sending out a motor? Do they, are they paying attention? Is it 56 inches? Is it 65? Is it standard? Are, are you running the same every time or are you running different with a different motor? Um, is anybody paying attention to how normal this is? Now, the, the, I can tell you the answer to that is no. The answer is, is that I can ask 100 engineers and 80 of them will give me different answers. And most of them will be like, well, I don't know. I have to go back and look. So the, <laughs> sorry, that's all right. So when you have this, I've got a little feedback. There we go. So the good kind of feedback. yeah, the good kind. So this matters, and the reason this matters is because uh, mitigation and remediation tools like our reamer are designed for a different length, and and reamers are different lengths, and they have different blade uh, types, and they're built differently. What we what we see is that if you don't pay attention to this number, and you don't pay attention to your your bend angle. And in this case, it would be a conventional motor. Is it two degrees? Is it 1.75? Is it 1.25? Is it 1.5? It, it all matters because the regularity and the amplitude of the spiral and pitch will change depending on these values. And your mitigation or remediation tool that you use to remove the spiraling, it matters how long the blades are because it will either follow the path of the pitch in the spiral or it will remediate it. If you, if you take a standard blade stabilizer and throw some TSPs in it, a couple of a few PVC blade, PVC elements in it, cutter elements, it may or may not be mitigating and remediating the issue, depending on how long your uh, bit to bend is. So the, the Typhoon Reamer is, is our tool. We built this tool originally for a packer set. So downhole packer sets, the problem was is that a packer element would, uh, it would either, you had a lot of MPT with false sets or not setting. And the problem with a packer element not setting is tortuosity. So we built this with specific design features in a way of remediating any, any length, bit to bend length. It doesn't matter whether your bit to bend is 36 inches or 56 or 60, this tool will remediate that issue because it's forced to deal with the, with the peaks and valleys. It has downhole, downhole reaming structure and uphole reaming structure. And in the middle is um, flow acceleration tool to, meant to Im improve hole cutting, uh, hole cleaning. So distance between the upper and the lower cutting structures along with the tapered leading edges that gradually engage the formation. This is key when, you, when you're removing and mitigating these, these cross section reductions. And this tool does it uh, very effectively. Now, 
this will show you this this simulation right here. Um, let me move this right quick. So this simulation is 80 RPM at, at 800 foot an hour. So this is way faster than what you would what you would typically see. And you can see how the cutting structure, because this is the downhole cutting structure. So this is entering the spiral first. This is the this is the your downhole blade cutting structure blades. There's three blades. Each one of them has a cutter block, and each one of those cutter block has five cutters on it. And as they interact with the formation, even at high speeds, you fast forward back to the back, and the back cutting structure is taking on the lighter blue color as you see it. So it's overlapping some of the blue. The reason this matters is that the faster you're drilling, if your cutting structure is not fully engaging with the well bore, you're just shoving your PDC cutter through a, one stage to the, to the next. And if, if you're moving the pipes fast enough, then you're not contacting the well bore solid enough. So as we see that you can actually speed up the drill string fast enough to shove a typical stabilizer through one of these spiraling events without affecting it at all. So it's really important, the contact structure, and it be completely proportionate coverage so that you see this type of coverage uh, in the end to mitigate these issues. So after successfully removing these micro tortuosity events, you can see that we can increase the drift up to 0.625 inches at 120 foot an hour and 80 RPM. And this results in less friction, less issues, better performance drilling. We, we also see that the longer you drill, the, the deeper we drill, the 28,000 foot wells, the 25,000 foot wells, we actually see reductions in torque, increases in hook load, and our overpull is, is way less than typically not running the tool. So it does have hole cleaning built into it, it has a unique body structure uh, that allows this flow bulb here, accelerates the fluid velocity across the tool. The impeller helps uh, take up cuttings and move them across as you're, as, you're, as you're going across, and it helps clean the well more as you're drilling. What we do, what we what we'd like to see is consistency in the data. We're, we're looking at when you're looking at millions and millions of feet drilled, and you're looking at overpull. This is in Well County, which is uh, in North America. This is the fastest drilling. These are guys that are drilling four to five wells a month to seventeen thousand feet. I mean that they're not doing that in the Permian. They're one and a half, two wells a month. So these guys are drilling consistently at 600 foot, 600 foot an hour on bottom. So they're, they're smoking wells down. And what we see is that even with an RSS and an eight and a half inch hole, we're able to reduce, we were able to reduce the, the overpull by almost 30%. And the engineer was, you know, the engineer said, well, Chris, you know, we're drilling a straight well bore. No, you're not. You're not drilling a straight well bore. Even with a rotary steerable, you're not. So there is an effect that happens with this. So we saw on average 23% reduction in this case study in overpull. We yanked the tool, went back to running that, 23% gain in overpull. Guess what that means? Additional casing running time, more MPT, there's issues there. So ultimately, this is in Lee County. This is an eccentric reamer versus a concentric reamer like what we have. We have a concentric design. There's eccentric reamers out there. What you see here, and the engineer was, uh, they were gracious enough to help us out with this study, is that we see, we want predictable and consistent 
over pull results or line or drag results. And what you see here from, from this, from this, the Typhoon Ringer runs, this is over and over, we repeat this. The, the values are more consistent. They're more, they're more, uh, um, they're more predictable in the end than with an eccentric version, which gives you a much wider path and also ledging, exacerbating, we call it exacerbating ledging. So as, a, as an eccentric reamer moves through these, these areas, we'll see this ledging where you see these, these peaks that come out where there's actually ledging occurring in the liner run. What it means is that the tool is actually opening up the, the area, but it's opening up at when it can. It's not opening up consistently. So depending on ROP, it's gonna open up the hole different. Depending on your bit to bend link, it's gonna open up the hole different. So these are, these are consistently what we see in eccentric versus concentric tools. And that's it. Um, I, I could go through a ton of technical data, but uh, those those charts right there kind of uh, kind of summarize what we see, um, and and what we see from a standpoint of do the do the mitigation, do the remediation and mitigation tools work? Yes, they work. Uh, we have customers run them, then they say, well, we don't want to spend the money. We're going to go back to not running a tool. And then they always call us back. They always call us back. So the idea is, is that either, either customers are running on hope. We hope that we can get case in the bottom. We hope that it goes smoother or they're running off of they're they're running off of actually a strategy to reduce MPT and do it consistently. And this is a conversation that happens all the time with our customers and sometimes wells are, are if we see differences in uh, compaction rates of rock so if you have a higher density rock and, you, and you're running this tool with a, uh, a locked up assembly and an eight and a half uh, eight and a half hole or six and three quarter if the rock is really dense versus rock that's not really dense you will see a difference in the actual torque values. You'll see a difference in your case and running times. So spiraling is affected by the rock compaction rates as well. And our ability to remove that rock is, is key to keeping these dysfunctions from happening. And we see better stick slip, better MSE. We've had Apache, which Blaine mentioned, Apache did a long case study running our tool, ran it consistently. And they didn't believe they had any issues. They said, we have no issues running casing. We have no issues drilling. Well, they ran the tool and they ran, they got 24% better uh, footage per day and their casing running times were improved substantially. So these are, these are, these are things we know for a fact. Every time we go to put a tool in the ground, we know that we can remediate the these micro tortuosity events, and we know that that ends up being a value to the customer. Now, whether or not they're willing to uh, see that it is an advantage or it's not is uh, up for discussion today. And I think during a panel discussion, we'll talk about that a little bit. Thank you. Chris, how much do you see in that companies are able to close the loop between drilling parameters and the ability to run AC? cognizant of that when they're making these decisions or are they they disjointed? I, I would say I would say roughly we we kind of measure the, the client based on the, the their maturity in, in in analyzing data, right? And I would say most of them kind of feel that 40 to 50 percent mature uh, rate. Uh, Apache is like very mature. So Apache is, a, is an example of a company that's extremely mature in understanding where the optimization opportunities are and what uh, impacts what. Uh, but you have companies that are very large 
that we run into that we believe we walk in believing they're very mature and they end up being very immature uh, and not that they don't have the same uh, capabilities to analyze and, and collect and consume they they're they're not they're dysfunctional internally and they don't have they're not communicating properly across channels the, one of the one of the major problems that we see is that we're running a tool in exploration that has impact on completions and production where those guys don't get to have a say in running this tool to remediate problems that they will see. And then by the time they see these problems, the guys that chose to whether to run it or not don't even care because they're not involved in the completions of the production. So if, if I was talking to a completions and production guy and I said, hey, we have this tool that remediates, it fixes these issues, it can help you. It, it's not the solution, but it's a solution. He's more likely to choose it than an, an exploration guy that's like, I got to get it fast, I got to get it cheap. So fast and cheap may not go, may not align well with the, with the quality and longevity of the, of the asset. Does that make sense? So to answer your question, I, I would say that very few companies the smaller independents are actually mature enough to see the advantage of this tool immediately and see the advantage of other tools that do the same thing or similar thing immediately. So it's a tough discussion. 